If you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And, um, you know, I don't think that it's an accident. I think that a lot of the songs kind of have fell right into what I was going to preach on today. And and, uh, for about three or four weeks now, God has impressed this passage uh, upon my heart. And uh, I not really had clearance until really this week to really preach it and and uh, it has really meant a lot to me in in recent days and uh, you know uh, as a pastor I I know that sometimes we go through things and you know I try to help and encourage and uh, be what I can to you all as you make phone calls to me and (coughs) you come and talk to me and I think it's also my duty now last two or three weeks I, I feel like I've preached some pretty hard messages and you know, I said, you know, it's good that you can preach a hard message like the last two Sundays and people still want you to come back to the pulpit. And so I want to say thank you uh, for uh, understanding that, hey, it's time to preach the Word of God. It's not time to shy away uh, from those tough portions of Scripture. It's time to share those uh, as we see the day approaching. Uh, as I turn on the news and I see what's happening uh, in our world today, as I see what's going on in Israel That's God's way of telling you and I to wake up. Uh, His coming is nigh. Uh, And it's not time to back away from God. It's time to get closer uh, to God. And so this morning, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to help you this morning uh, here in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Uh, The title of my message, as you already see, is When God Says No. When God Says No. Let us look here in chapter 12 in verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. (coughs) For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today, Lord, and we ask for your blessings upon the reading of your word. Lord, today my mission as the pastor of this church is to encourage and help. (coughs) Many of us are in prayer over things and many of us have needs. Many of us have prayer requests that are upon our heart today. (coughs) And Lord, I know today that Lord, that sometimes when we pray, it takes a time. Lord, things don't happen, Lord, on our calendar. They happen on yours. Lord, sometimes we don't get the answer we're looking for until maybe five or six years of prayer or five or six months of prayer. And sometimes we never receive an answer as far as the answer that we want is simply because you have already told us no. Lord, I'm a firm believer today that when we pray, you answer. Your word affirms what I just said. And Father, today, help us to understand as your children, just as you are our heavenly Father. Lord, just like our earthly Father, sometimes we were told no as children. May we be reminded today that our earthly Father sometimes says no. Lord, I pray today that we would look past the word no and we would see exactly what you're trying to teach us in this passage of Scripture. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. When God says no. You know, everyone knows the Apostle Paul. He's probably one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. He loved the Lord and he served Him with all his heart, mind, and soul. I think nobody would debate that this morning. It may come to a shock as some in our world today to see someone living so godly and yet suffering so badly. 
It's a question I've asked myself several times. Individuals who have given their life to the Lord and yet seem to suffer badly. In this passage of Scripture, Paul has this problem. We, we are not told exactly what the problem is, but we know that <coughs> Paul has a problem. We know that Paul has a situation. We know that Paul has a prayer. And just like any Christian that's right with God would do, Paul had a problem, so what did he do? He went to the Lord in prayer. I do hope that you go to the Lord in prayer when you have a problem. I do hope that you find your way to your prayer closet when there's a need. You know, it's so funny. Sometimes, you know, we come to the pastor, or we come to our Sunday school teacher, or we come to our deacons before we'll even approach God in prayer. I used to tell my teenagers as a youth pastor, they would come to me with a problem, and I would always tell them, I said, well, have you prayed about this? No. I said, how about this? I said, you go and you pray about this and then come back and talk to me. Now, I'm here to help. But God can do far better than I could ever imagine. And we go to God. And so that's what Paul did. He, he didn't go to his neighbor. He didn't go to anybody else. He went to God in prayer over his problem. He begged God to remove the problem. Much to our surprise in our passage, God doesn't take it away. God says no. You know, he, he doesn't take the thorn away. And that surprises some of us because we realize how faithful Paul was and how much of a godly example he was. But the fact of the matter is, God did not abandon Paul. He, he may have not given Paul the answer that Paul probably desired, we must understand that there are some times that when we pray, God says no. What started this out is, as an individual, I'm a Christian just like you all. I live the life just like you all. I'm no different than you are. I put on my shoes, I put on my pants the same way you put on yours. I, 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 I walk out and I live the life just like you live the life. And sometimes in my life, I have prayed prayers and I have really just knew that God needed to move. I had a predicament. I had a problem. You know, I had a situation in Ohio. I had individuals that attacked me. I had a lady, the whole time I was there, all she wanted to do was hinder my work. She hated me. Uh, she was leading the youth group, and I came in. The pastor wanted me to, to train the kids, and she didn't like that too well. She was a 60-year-old woman working with young people, and, and I'm going to tell you, she did not like the fact that I was there, and I'm telling you, I prayed. I said, God, would you please remove this? And I'm telling you, everywhere I turned, I mean, I had to peer record my phone conversations. It got that bad. And she was just out to get me. And I've met people in ministry like that. That was a problem for me. That was a thorn for me. And I remember kneeling down and I said, God, would you please take this away? I could do so much more if, if you would take this obstacle and this stumbling block out of my way. And I'm sad to report this morning that God did not answer my prayer. He kept her there until the very last year of my ministry. God moved her on the fifth year. You know, looking back at it now, I have to laugh, to be honest with you, but I prayed and God said no. And, and often I would think, well, God's not answering my prayer. God's not moving in my prayer. What's going on? I mean, I've got a problem, and God's not hearing me. But the simple fact of the matter is, God did hear me. He just said no. So often when we don't get our prayers answered the way we want, let's be honest this morning. Don't we say God hasn't answered our prayer? When God says no, now I understand sometimes... God doesn't say no. Sometimes God wants us to continually pray. And I think about the woman who followed Jesus and begged for her to be healed. And she followed Jesus and Jesus finally turned around and healed her. I understand that sometimes God just wants to exercise faith in us. God wants us to continually believe in Him and continue to pray. But understand that there are some times that when we do pray, God says no. You won't find that on television. They'll tell you that it's because you have a lack of faith. That's why your prayers are not being answered. I want you to understand that that was not Paul's problem. The problem Paul had was that God said no. 
We don't understand that. We can't fathom that. But sometimes God says no. And I want to help you understand that sometimes God doesn't take away the pain. Sometimes God doesn't take away the sickness. Sometimes God does not take away the problem. Sometimes God just says no. I want to share this truth with you real quickly. And I I probably won't last long. My voice is already starting to tear apart. But I want us to look at a few things. Number one, let's look at Paul's predicament. Let's look at Paul's predicament. The Bible tells us that there was a thorn. In verse 7 he says there was a thorn given to him. Now most people like to comment on what this thorn was. There's really no evidence as to exactly what the thorn was. We don't know. Some people say, well, it's the messenger of Satan. But if you notice, he refers to it as an it. So we understand that there's a possibility that there was some problem. Maybe it was a sickness. Matter of fact, some people even believe that it was Paul's eyesight. If you look in other passages of Scripture, he talks about the fact that his eyes were growing poorly. He was having to write large letters because of his eyesight diminishing and You know, anybody who was right with God uh, knows that Paul, how right with God he was. Desired to fellowship with God and read God's Word. Could you imagine the pain and agony that went in Paul's life that he could not even hardly read the Word of God because of his eyesight. And Maybe his eyesight was the thorn. Maybe it was some kind of sickness with his eyes. Maybe it was a problem. Maybe it was a person. We don't know. But I was reading a commentator this week and he made the statement. He said he believed the reason why God doesn't tell us what the thorn is because God wanted to make this passage applicable for all of us. Because thorns come in different shapes and sizes. Would we not agree? Problems come in different shapes and sizes. The problems in your home are not the problems in my home necessarily. The sicknesses that we deal with in our families is not the sicknesses that maybe across the way they don't deal with. The trials and the tribulations that you deal with are yours and yours. You walked in with them. Nobody else walked in with your problem but you. So thorns come in all different shapes and sizes. And and many tonight, as I look upon you in this congregation this morning, you have prayers on your heart and mind. You have desires for God to move and and do great things in your life. You desire for God to answer prayers and, and move in a situation. And I know that's all of you. I know all of us have a prayer on our heart. All of us have something that we desire God to to answer and 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 work in. And that was Paul here. Paul had a predicament. He had a, he had a thorn. So, what was it? This predicament, well, it bothered him. We do know that much. This is what we do know about the thorn. The thorn bothered Paul. The thorn hurt Paul. Matter of fact, the, the Greek word for thorn is a sharp wooden stick or splinter. The idea of impacting. The idea of pain. It caused continual suffering. The word buffet there in verse 7 literally (coughs) means to continue to suffer or be attacked. Paul was continually suffering with this problem. It was not what Paul wanted. We see that in the past. Paul did not want or ask for this thorn. Paul was serving God. I mean, it seemed like everywhere Paul went, a church popped up. It seemed like everywhere Paul went, God used him to see people saved. And thousands upon thousands of people today, uh, we look at the Word of God and we see how God used his ministry to lead many and countless people to Christ. And so Paul, this is not what Paul needed. And I know many times in my life when thorns come in and, and things come in, it's never in a convenient hour. It's never something, I always sometimes even ask God, I say, God, I didn't ask for this. God, things are going so good. Why did you have to throw an egg in the plan? It's not, we don't don't ask or beg God for thorns. Paul didn't want this. Again, Paul had a predicament. It hindered him. That's obvious. It hindered him. Also, it was an attack. Notice the Bible says in verse 7 that it was a messenger of Satan 
Satan brought this upon Paul. The idea here really is the idea of Job. Remember, God allowed Satan to tempt Job. I believe it's the same situation you could easily say of this passage of Scripture. It was an attack. I want you to understand something. You're here this morning. The devil don't like it. The devil don't like it that you're trying to lead your home in the right way. The devil doesn't like it when you try to serve God and you teach your children biblical principles. The devil doesn't like it when you serve God and and go to your prayer closet. The devil doesn't like it this morning that you are faithful to Him. And buddy, let me tell you something. If you're going to serve God and you're going to do all that you can for Him, you go ahead and mark her down. Satan's going to be on your heel. It's just a fact of life. It was an attack. It was also a painful blow to his ministry. Again, (coughs) the word buffet means to be a painful blow. So, Paul had a problem. It was a problem. Paul had to deal with this. So what does Paul do? I mean, we all have been in this similar situation. We all have things in our lives and we all have prayers that we feel need to be answered and it's a burden, it's a heavy weight, it's a problem. This is where Paul is. And sometimes we tend to think people like Paul and Peter and James and John are on a whole other level than what we are. The fact of the matter is they're just as human as you and I. They face the same things. You know, there's people out there today that will tell you this book is not relevant. But it is. This book is relevant for this day. We see Paul, just like you and I, going through a time just like you and I have faced. This morning, if I was to ask a show of hands, and I'm not, of how many thorns are present in our church, how many prayer requests are in the balance this morning, how many prayers are, you feel like maybe there's not an answer. You feel like God's not directing these things the way you want them to go. And you pray and you pray and you pray. Yet this morning you walk in here and your heart is so heavy and you have questions. You don't understand why you sit in your sickness. You don't understand why you sit in your despair. You don't understand why. The fact of the matter is this morning you are not alone. We all go through these times. We all face thorns, just like Paul did. Paul had a predicament, just like many of us have. It's very interesting here that, what does Paul do? Well, it brings me to my next point, I'm glad you asked. And that is Paul's prayer. Let's look at Paul's prayer here. Chapter 12 and verse 7, or verse 8. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Paul took the situation to God in prayer. He took it to the one that he knew could handle it. You know what? Why do we pray? This morning, why do you go to God in prayer? Because we believe God can handle it, right? We believe God has the power to heal us. We we believe God has the power to restore us. We believe God has the power to make a problem all right. We believe God can make the wrongs right. Amen? That's why we go to God in prayer. We go to God in prayer because God told us if we, we want to ask Him anything, to ask Him. He told us in 1 Peter 5 to cast all our care upon Him because He careth for us. He says you have not because you what? Ask not. So what was Paul doing? He was just doing what God told him to do. He, he said, I've got a problem. I'm going to go to God about this. It was a predicament. It was a trouble. It was a thorn. He goes to God in prayer. (coughs) But what do we notice about this prayer? We notice, number one, that Paul prayed not once, but three times. So you mean to tell me that Paul, a warrior for God, Paul, I mean, a landmark Christian, Went to God in his distress and God did not answer him the first time? Yes, God did not answer him the first time. Now you can tell me, preacher, I don't understand why God did that. I don't either. I, I, 
I'm only human. I'll never quite fully understand God until I reach heaven, hopefully. <clears throat> and we don't know why sometimes. But Paul prayed once, but then Paul prayed twice. I'm looking at some people this morning. That's you. This message right here has fit, fitted in shoe leather for you. You absolutely understand where I'm coming from this morning. And that's okay. You say, preacher, I've prayed twice and God has not answered me. That's Paul. Paul prayed twice. God didn't answer him. Do you know how faithful Paul was? I mean, this is not adding up to me. Paul was a man of God. Paul lived for God. Paul's heart was for God. And if there was somebody there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, it was Paul. And there was somebody there that was faithful and that was gung-ho for God and served God with a passion. It was Paul. But Paul prayed twice and God did not answer. But then Paul prays three times. And God begins to speak to him. After the third time, you know what, I have to be honest with you as your pastor, there's been times I've been to God in prayer for one time and I give up on it. Sometimes God wants to just test our faith. Again, we pray until God answers. And again, it's not that we pray until God answers it the way we want to. We pray until God answers and that settles it. Amen. And that's what happened with Paul. But notice here that Paul begged God to take it away. The word basalt is also a word for prayer, but also has the idea of begging. It's a beg begging for prayer. It's the idea of hitting their knees. Matter of fact, the idea, you can honestly say, what Paul was doing here, he prayed seriously and sincerely. How many of you have ever been to God in prayer? And it's one of them situations where you knew that God had to move or you didn't know what was going to go on. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you literally just begged God to move and sweat and tears and agonized over a situation and you begged God to take the thorn away and you begged God, you said, Lord, take it away. Lord, please. And, and boy, you got up and you had so much faith and you just knew God heard your prayer because you had a sincere heart and you, you knew that the Bible said if we just have faith of a tiny little mustard seed and you said to that mountain, be thou removed. And God said it will be removed. And you had that mustard seed faith and you begged God and you pleaded with God just like Paul did. You catch it? Paul did that. He begged God. God still said no. I think sometimes we have this idea that we can get in here and sincerely beg God for everything and God's going to do exactly what we want. We must understand when we come to God in prayer, we come in His will. Notice also Jesus tells us to pray in His will. Sometimes what we want and what God wants are two different things. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I want my life to be pie in the sky by and by. I ain't going to lie to you. I want a full bank account. Uh, I, I want to take care of my family. I want no sickness. I got a mom and dad in Jacksonville. I want them to live forever. I, I've got family that I dearly love. I, you know, uh, things are going well. I, you know, I, I want church to go good. I, I want us to come in here and feel like we've been to church every Sunday. I, I want life to be good. But understand that the Bible tells us that all that live godly shall suffer persecution. He has told us in John chapter 16 that in the world you will have tribulation. These are things that are promised to us. When we come to God in prayer. We need to understand that God has a plan and God has a purpose. You see, here's the idea. We must understand that sometimes God says no. We must understand and I want us to understand something real quickly. It had nothing to do with Paul's faith because Paul was a man of faith. It had nothing to do with what he had done. Paul had not sinned. Some people look at somebody that's going through this. Well, that's probably because they've done something. No, sometimes things just come and we've done nothing. God said no, not because of Paul's faith, not because of something Paul did. God just said no. And under that, we understand that God knows best. 
We've got to understand that when we come to God in prayer. It's not about me. It's about Him. And God knows best. My dad told me no all the time. You've heard me say that several times. You've heard me say that the best, one of the most favorite vocabulary words of my dad was no. But just as my earthly father said no, my heavenly father said no. Why was that? Because daddy knows best. He knew what was on the horizon. He knew what was up. He knew a whole lot more than I did. God knows best. He does have a plan. Do you know that? God has a plan. Do you think he had a plan for Paul? Yeah. Paul didn't understand it. And let me tell you something this morning. You don't have to understand all about your thorn to believe that God can move in your situation. You don't have to understand it all. Just trust God. He has a plan. And he has a purpose. We may not understand it. We may never see it. Until we reach heaven. But understand in your trial today, God has a plan, He has a purpose, and He knows best. And so here we are this morning to our final thought. We understand about God saying no. We understand that Paul had a predicament. But let's look at Paul's promise. Let's look at Paul's promise. Now, God did say no. But in that no, God had a promise. I want you to understand something this morning. Even if God says no, there's still the promises of God. Even if God says no, I'm not taking away, we do have something we can leave here with this morning. And that is a promise. Look there in verses 9 and 10. And he said, God said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. But look, look, this is where Paul got. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. Paul may not have got the answer that he wanted, but he did get a promise. God promised him grace. This morning you may ask, what exactly is grace? I like what one guy said. Grace actually spells out God's riches available at Christ's expense. It is God's unmerited and undeserved favor. You've heard me say this several times as your pastor. An easy way for you to understand grace is simply this. God loves you, period. God loves me, period. He takes me with all my flaws and all my problems. He looks at me and He loves me with an everlasting love, period. No questions asked. Grace. Grace contains every promise that has ever been made to us. I want you to understand, if you look at every promise in this Bible, the fact that He's never, He said He promised He'll never leave us nor forsake us. The fact that He said He'll provide our every need. The fact that He said He'll take care of us. The fact that said He'll go before us. All these promises are wrapped up in the grace of God. Think about it. When Paul is told that He says, Paul, I'm not taking it away, but I want you to understand something. You have all that you will ever need, and that is my grace. That is my grace. It is God's provision for our every need when we need it most. What about this grace? The Bible tells us a little bit about this grace here in chapter 12. We understand from the text that this grace is continual. Matter of fact, when he says that my grace is sufficient for thee, you can read this in the text and do no harm to it. He's literally saying my grace is continually sufficient for you. It's continual action in the Greek. So what he's saying is, Paul, my grace, my unmerited, undeserved favor, the fact that I love you, period, the fact that I'm for you, Paul, is continual. It's every day. It's day by day. 
What are you saying, preacher? What he's saying there is that every day when God said, no, I'm not taking it away. Paul looks at him, I'm sure I have to go through this with this sickness. I have to go through life with this problem. I have to go through life with this trial. And God, you're telling me that, that you're not going to do this, but you're telling me that your grace is sufficient for me. What is he saying? Day by day, when Paul hit his feet from the night of sleep, God's grace was there. When God continued, when Paul continued down the road of life, after this point, God's grace was there. I want you to understand something this morning. God may tell you no, but there's never a time when God's grace leaves you. The fact that God loves you, period, this morning. The, the answer may be no, but I can take with me the fact that God has promised me that His grace will be there day by day. Every day. So His grace is continual, but then His grace is sufficient. The word sufficient means to have enough. Paul had exactly what he needed to make it. Oh, it wasn't ideal for Paul. Paul wanted it gone. God said no. But every day he had God's grace and it was enough. Once you understand something this morning, God's grace is enough. He may not take it away. But I'm going to tell you something this morning. The fact that God loves me, period, is enough. God is for you this morning. And the Bible says in Romans, if God be for us, who can be against us? You have everything you need, even though God has said no. God says, my grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. His grace is strengthening. His grace is strengthening. Notice here the Bible says in verse 9, For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul was dependent as long as this problem existed. Notice there. Maybe the reason why God won't take this pain or thorn away is because God wants you to remain dependent upon Him. I think this is what God was trying to teach Paul. He says, God, he says Paul, I'm trying to teach you to depend on me. It's not about you. I know what you have. I know the thorn. I know the sickness. I know the problem. I know the pain. I know the situation. I know the predicament you're in. I know the heaviness. I know the sorrowness of your heart. But I want you to understand that with all of that included, I will help you. I will sustain you. I will keep you going. I will give you the strength. It's not about you. It's about me working in you. This morning, God says no. I want you to know we've got a promise. God's grace is sufficient. We've got the strength to carry through. I like the meaning of the word perfect. Notice that his strength is made perfect. The word perfect there means to be carried through. I like that. You know what God's saying there? Paul, in those times that you can't even get up and walk on your own, in those times that you don't know where to take the next step. In those times that you feel like waving the white flag, I want you to know that I'll carry you. And I'm so glad that there's times in my life that I know that there was no way but Brother Tom, I'm here today to tell you there's times in my life, those times that I could not go on are the very times that God carried me. I'm looking at some individuals this morning that you just need God to carry you. God's promised you that He'll do it. All you got to do is lean on Him. All you got to do is trust His Word. And His grace will be sufficient. But also we notice that His grace is powerful. Notice that in verse 9. He says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the what power of Christ may rest upon me. Living dependent upon God, there is nothing that you and I can't face. That's what Paul's saying. Paul 
went from being defeated to victorious through the message of God's grace. And this morning, God's grace has not changed. The fact of the matter is, God is here this morning. He's calling out to you. He's talking to you about your thorn. He maybe have told you no. He may have said, no, I'm not taking it away. But this morning at Belvoir Free Will Baptist Church, just as I carried Paul, I will carry you. Maybe this morning we just need to hear that message this morning. We need to be encouraged in conclusion this morning. God does not give us His grace simply that we might endure our sufferings. Even unconverted people can manifest great endurance. God's grace, listen to this. God's grace should enable us to rise above our circumstances and feelings and cause our afflictions to work for us in accomplishing His good. God wants to build our character this morning so that we are more like our Savior. God's grace enabled Paul not only to accept his affliction, but to glory in them. His suffering was not a tyrant that controlled him. I know a lot of Christians this morning that your suffering has made, it's it's a tyrant over you. His suffering was not a tyrant that controlled him, but a servant that worked for him. By God's grace, Paul went to defeat to victory. And this morning I want to leave you with this. Go ahead and flip to the next one there. I'll leave you a statement. What what did Paul realize? What did Paul realize? I want you to think about your thorn this morning. I don't know what it is, but God does. And here's what I want you to think about. The thorn was not a problem. At first it may look like it was a problem. Yes, it was a predicament. And he had to go to God in prayer over it. Yes, and we should do those things. But understand, the thorn was not a problem, but an opportunity for God to work. This morning, I wonder how many thorns are in this congregation. And this morning, I just want to help you. I wonder how many of you will take your thorn to the altar this morning and say, God... I don't know what you're going to say. Maybe you already know God has said no. Maybe God has come to you while I'm preaching and said no. Maybe you just want to come and find that grace that Paul found because it's sufficient, it's enough, and it'll last you every day of your life. Maybe you need to understand this morning that it's not a problem, it's an opportunity for you to see God work in your life because God wants to do those things. This morning, maybe you're here and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You've got the biggest thorn of of all. Maybe you'd like to come and trust Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you'd like to come and and be saved, be born again. If that's you today, you can do that. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning.